Hello, my name is Jim. My device is a very simple thing to make rope. Uh, with the start of war in 1939, materials became very scarce. And so we had to carry on with some of the old ways of doing things. Rope was often made out of binder band, which was used in the harvesting machine. And so we had to uh, splice, learn to tie knots. Rope was used for all sorts of things on the farm. And I remember as a boy when I had to turn this thing for ages to make rope. Hello, my father, George F. Giles, had an ironwood shop at number one Grove Street for the best part of 50 years. We seem to establish it started there in 1910 and operated for all that time with perhaps just one break when he was a dispatch rider during the First World War in, in France. Uh, all sorts of things were sold in our shops and there were, there were in fact three in Redford at the time. I can remember in the 1950s there were two more. One was Curtis Howells in Carrollgate, which is where the amusement arcade is now, and one was Neil's, which is on the square where, or was on the square, where uh, Argos is now. There was a slight emphasis, difference of emphasis in what they used to sell, but basically it was, very, it was very similar stuff. You could buy almost anything from the small to the large, you could buy a couple of three quarter inch screws, or you could buy something like the butter churn and the mangle, which are in, on display in another part of the museum. This, this object that I have here isn't actually for sale, it was actually sold in the shop. It was hired out because it's something that you'd only use for a couple of hours once a year. And it was somewhat erroneously referred to as the marmalade machine, <coughs> which is something of a misnomer because it doesn't make marmalade. What it does is to shred the fruit without having to do it manually, but with a knife, which, which takes forever. The thing works basically by cutting the fruit into quarters, feeding it into the tube, pressing the plunger again. The thing is mounted on a, on a worktop, or perhaps in those days it would have been a wooden kitchen table. The handle goes back and forth. There's a double edged blade in there. The shredded fruit juice streams down the front into a bowl placed underneath, makes a devil of a mess, but it works very well. We're not really sure of what age this is, but we would think it might even be Victorian. Um, it is very old, but it does work. I've used, uh, well, I haven't used it, but I, I've been the handle operator. My, my mother and my wife have used it, and I, I've just been the handle operator. It's quite a good, good wheeze, really, because you don't have to do the clearing up. Uh, it, it is something that uh, you don't see very much of nowadays, and it, 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 as I say, it is very, very efficient. Very messy. My name is Liz Meacher and the object I've brought to the exhibition is this green drinking bottle. And I remember when, as a child, this bottle would come with us on all our picnics um, with orange juice squash inside of it. Um, one of the things I remember mostly about it really is that I wished I could have had a disposable drinks container. I had to carry this with me all the day, um, even when it was empty. And somehow we've managed to keep it in the family and it's a fond reminder of school trips, days out to London Zoo and such like. And even though back then I wanted disposable throwaway containers, little did I know that 60 years later I'd be picking up the discarded containers that other people have used and finished with as I walk along the streets in Redford. Hello, I'm uh, George Roy Bennett, uh, a retired builder and living in the village of North Wheatley, which is only five miles away from the museum. I've lived there all my life, uh, and my memory today is this little steam engine that I must have got for Christmas, either 1945 or 1946. It must have been prior to 47, because my father died in October 47. Uh, and he, my mother says that he found it on a scrap heap 
or somebody was throwing it away and he got it and repaired it. The repair being, I feel, that this little metal age of spirit uh, heating element was a, off a petrol can, a Prax petrol can. And just fill it with methylated spirits, light it, put it in, fill it with water through here, or hot water, so we don't waste so much fuel. Uh, and then when the steam is up, a bit of string from here to the bobbin, we'll just send the bobbin around. The reason it's a little bit of wood with a cotton bobbin is that my father was a thrashing machine engine driver, and, he had, and that represented the drum. And so just to make it a bit realistic for me, as a young lad of about eight or nine, he did that for me because I used to have to work with him on a Saturday morning when I used to go thrashing. And this is my memory and what a, a toy for a young lad of that age. Now it's travelled about with me, we've moved out just two or three times, and my youngest son, who was about four, what is it now? I said, so the steam engine, can we get it going? Well, we got it going, and he just laughed his head off, sat at the kitchen table. Now, we've been up to see him a fortnight since, and I took this with me, and he's there sat at the table with his young son, who was three and a half, and me at the table, and my wife took a, a video of it going, you know, and it was just a joke. Let's see it go. Wow. She's away. She's away now, Lacey, isn't she? Yeah, she's mm -hmm. away. <coughs> it's really little. Mm -hmm. Pardon? It's really little. It's really little. Now, that was my little. toy as a little boy. And he said, he said, didn't he have to let me have a fire then? <laughs> yeah. So he walked out. <laughs> oh, well, you were nine. I was nine, eight nine, say, yeah. 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 Oh, it's really nice. Um, these interesting origami tanks. Um, these were originally made 
from candy stick sweets, also known as cigarette sweets. Um, growing up in the 80s, these were a really popular sort of candy treat at the time. And I remember when my grandfather, as a young child, he actually showed me how to take the original box and make a few adjustments and basically turn them into these colourful origami tanks. It's something that I now share with my children. I know my older brother shares with his children too. Um, and it's just become customary to every time you see a box, turn them into one, either matchstick boxes or, or anything in that respect. Um, we're not sure where my grandfather actually found this technique. We think it may have been in his service in the Second World War, where he would have taken um, cigarette boxes and turned them into these tanks. Um, he probably reappropriated it for me and my brothers. Um, as a working visual artist, I actually then turned hundreds of these into a, a visual art display in London. And it's just been really fun to share this. We thought that everybody knew how to make these, but it seems they don't. No one's ever seen them before, which is a really fun object to share. Um, my grandfather spent his final years here in Redford, and these simple tanks have always been a great way to remember him. And I think it's really interesting, actually, that maybe it's not the physical heirlooms that we sort of um, share, but sometimes it's maybe a memory or a skill or a technique that's actually worth sharing and treasuring. Hello, my name is Judith Goodall. Um, I've lived in Redford all my life. Um, I was an only child, and I chose my object because it reminds me of my dad. Um, he was a treasurer at Retford Town Football Club. And even though I was a girl, I used to go with him to the matches. Um, and uh, I also chose the items because of the adverts inside, a lot of Retford businesses that no longer exist. And also, um, one of the advertisers is my uncle, who was a renovating tailor in the town. Um, so, um, I have lots of other items at home, um, but it's a really packed garage and they're all at the back, so um, I've just brought a couple of items to display that I think um, show my involvement. Um, and I say, it's the fondest memories I've got uh, remembering going to the football with my dad. One of the memories I've got of the, of the ground and the sights and the smells and the sound um, as we used to go to the ground there was always records playing, refreshments uh, available. Um, one of my lasting memories is the fact that um, Bob Frill was available and I used to hate the smell of it um, and I still do. Um, it's one of the things that's uh, um, lasted in my memory um, and uh, I still don't like it at all. One of my weirdest memories of my time at the ground was on the day when one of the players lost a contact lens. Um, they played the whole match and uh, after the match had finished, uh, we formed a line from, and walked from one goal mask to the other. Um, and miraculously, um, we're talking about when the football boots were leather with proper studs and uh, we found the contact lens intact, despite the fact that two teams and the referee had run up and down that pitch, um, and it was intact, so um, quite an event, and, and quite a memorable event, that one. Hello, my name's Joan. I brought along these two cards. One of them is a cigarette uh, packet with embassy written on it, and they both have buttons sewn on, on them. Uh, through these I remember my mother uh, and how she, she made them and I've kept them for years and years. My mother was born in 1911 and she lived through two world wars. She was from a mining family and so they weren't very well off. She throughout her life saved everything that she could uh, to use again and nowadays we call that recycling. She always, I remember, cut off the buttons from all the old and worn garments. Shirt, skirt, cardigan, coats, all had to be saved. And not like me, I threw them all in a box, but my mum sewed them onto small scraps of card and saved the cards until she needed the buttons again. You'll notice that on the back of these buttons, there's an embassy cigarette card. And Embassy were her favourite cigarettes in the 70s, partly because they got filter tips 
and also because they had coupons inside each packet. And if you collected all the coupons, you could have something from the embassy catalogue. Well, she collected an awful lot of these. You needed hundreds to be able to buy something from that catalogue and send them off. And whenever we went to visit her in the northeast, she usually got some something from the uh, embassy catalogue. And it turned out that it was often Pyrex casserole dishes. And we were newly married in 1970, so this was her way of providing us with things for our home and setting us up. We haven't got the Pyrex dishes any longer, and I say it's nearly 50 years, uh, but I still have the card and the buttons, and I keep them because they remind me of her, her life, and those times. I'm Hilary Bennett and I brought along four recipe books because those recipe books plot my the time I was introduced to food and to cooking something which became a lifetime love for me so I brought a book uh, of recipes that my mum and I got together it's all written in a school notebook and some of them were written by hand and some of the things cut out of the recipe of uh, magazines I bought my first recipe book that I bought when I was probably about 12 with a, a book token. I bought it from Boots in Lincoln and I remember going shopping in, along in the books and the pictures which Boots at that time sold along with pastas and medicine. And then I got another book which was the only prize I ever won at school but I won that for housecraft. And as a result of me sort of doing quite well at Housecraft and really enjoying it, the head teacher um, on my career interview said to me, you're quite good at cookery, so I think you should become a cookery teacher. And so I did. That was career's advice. Uh, the, the other book I brought is a little book that was given free with Woman's Magazine, where you, it was colour-coded and you stick the recipes in it. People have also been very important. My grandma was a country woman. She cooked from what she had in the garden, what we would now call foraging. She cooked rooks, we had rook pie. They had a pig, she killed a pig. That meant sausages and pork pies and brawn and scraps, which was what you did with the bits of fat. And then my aunt, who was my mum's sister, she was a very good cook and I used to go and stay for her with her for my holidays in Gainsborough, which always makes people laugh. But we used to cook together, and on an afternoon we would make some scones, and then we'd sit down and listen to Mrs. Dale's diary with a scone and a cup of tea. And then last of all, but no man means least, is my mum, because she encouraged me to cook. She was a good plain cook. We had a meat and two veg at 12 o'clock dinner time, and then tea time. She baked once a week with a big selection of things which lasted you through the week. She went shopping in the village, she bought, she bought all her things in the village. She had bread and fish and milk delivered. And my first memory of milk being delivered was brought with a pony and a trap. And the lady had a lady in can and she brought it into the jug for you. Food, as you can see, has been important to me, both professionally because I did become a cookery teacher which then became a home economics teacher and then a food technology teacher and that's when I stopped because my idea of using food was to encourage young people to become independent, to know how to prepare food, to know and to share the love of cooking with food and sharing meals with friends, with family, even strangers, which brings a whole dimension to your life. Hello, I'm Kevin Murphy, and this is my object, and a bit of documentary evidence to go with it. It's a crucifix carved by a prisoner of war for his camp guard in 1919 in northern France. So my object, for me, is a symbol of hope. And I've had it since I was 11. When I was 11, I joined a junior seminary, which is a training school for children who want to be um, priests and 
in my case, a Franciscan friar in later life. And my family were very proud of this, and my uh, grandma, my mother's mother, gave me these two objects together. And they were what her husband, my grandpa, a card that he sent her from the front in France, and this crucifix that was made for him after the war. On the 9th of September 1916, he sent this card to Edith with fondest love, your Jim. And that's written in ordinary writing, and in the very bottom corner in tiny writing is a little addition, pray for me. This was the Battle of the Somme. And two months later, he was gassed. And he didn't die, like many of his friends did. But he was never able to be employable again after the war. And so he had to make a way for himself. So he sent it to his wife. And this is probably his embarkation picture, uh, just before himself to France with Edie and she's got a locket round her neck that he had given to her. So if this was 1915 or 16, they didn't marry until 1922 because he needed to be employable and be able to look after her. And in doing that, he would need a job. And the only way he did that was to employ himself in a job that he could work when he was fit. Now this object, he wasn't fit but he was fit enough to do something in the war, and he wasn't let off at his uh, whatever length of time he was supposed to work in the army. Um, the war was over, but this is Trueville, 1919. And it's a crucifix carved with a penknife by a German prisoner of war for Jim Puga, his camp guard. They were both Catholics. And the German, who saw, whose name we don't know, which is a bit sad, carved this for him for his care. And that has stood to me as a symbol of hope. Every time there's somebody who's died, we light a candle with this. Every time I've had an exam, I've prayed with this. Every time I've had tribulations with my four children, I've prayed to this. And so it's taken me through. Four years ago, I started to investigate our own local prisoner of war, war camp at Nether Heaton, three miles away. And in doing that, I found that there wasn't a decent story about it, so I've written it. It's called The Convicted for Courage, and the book will be available uh, to buy and to see here at the museum. Hello. I've been asked to come in to the museum uh, today to uh, explain a little bit about the artefact that um, I've let them borrow for their exhibition. So I remember when I was given this artifact, um, as you can probably see, um, it's a tapestry that's framed. And it was given to me by my mother um, after my father had died. And it's a tapestry of a patron saint. Um, his name is Saint Egidio and um, he hails from a very small place in Italy called Electronico, which is where my father was born and raised. So all through his life his family um, and the villagers would you know, uh, pray to this patron saint. Um, he was their protector um, and he supposedly performed miracles um, around that place. So my father, as a boy, um, left home age of 11, 12 years old and went to work down the salt mines in Sardinia. And with him, he always had a small prayer card of, of this saint, so a protector. Then through his life, he then eventually became a soldier and, as we know, now was in the World War II. And through that time, again, he had his prayer card with him. But there was a time when, as a prisoner of war, here, very local, um, at Eden Camp, 
they were made to march from the camp uh, towards Newark and other places, crossing fields, crossing roads. And as he did that, uh, troops, with the rest of the troops, he would sometimes look on the ground and pick up pieces of thread, um, any, any thread, and he would then put it in his pocket. Um, and what he used to do is when they were locked up at night, after sharing a blanket with one of the other um, prisoner, um, he would make it. He made this tapestry from just little bits of thread, and uh, hoping that he could be protected while he was a prisoner of war. So I sometimes look at it and think, what an amazing feat that that he that he did to be able to do that, and the accuracy of it is incredible. And I now think, if I remember that. If he only knew that when he was locked up and doing this of an evening and making something as precious as this, um, that eventually the world would eventually see it. Um, and that's basically where this artifact comes from. And it's been hanging over um, their bedroom wall um, as, through their lives. He met my mother over here and again, a little bit of story. This protector Saint Egidio um, meant so much to them that when my mother and father met and married um, within a very short space of time, um, my mother was told that she couldn't have children. It was physically impossible for her to have children. Um, so they prayed and prayed and seven years later I was born and uh, it was a bit of a shock to my mother because she was eight months pregnant and didn't know that she was. Um, so this saint has been around for a while and he's done a few things in his time. And uh, one of the things he did do was he gave him his name, or they gave him his name, so I called it Egidio. <laughs>